If you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and try to answer the question on your own before listening on. We're going to begin by just erasing this line that's marked R, just to get it out of our way temporarily. And what we'll do next is we'll choose a very small section of the circle that has the charge of positive Q. And we can just color in a little section of that. Because it's so tiny, the amount of charge on that section would also be tiny. And we can actually call that tiny amount of charge dQ. And because it's a positive charge, we know that the electric field produced by it would be pointing away from that positive charge over here at point P. So if we draw a vector that points away from that positive charge at point P, we would have a vector that looks something like this. And that would be the electric field due to that tiny amount of positive charge. We will do a similar thing for the portion of this semicircle that's labeled negative Q, and we'll do it in a corresponding position. So approximately right here, we would have a tiny amount of negative charge that we can also call dQ. And we know that negative charges produce electric fields that point towards the negative charge. So over here at point P, we would have an electric field line of the same magnitude that we drew earlier, but this time we're sort of pointing it towards the charge. And what's important to note about these two electric fields that we have just drawn is that their x components actually cancel. And maybe to see that, we can draw the x component. We can project a vector along the negative x direction to make the x component, and then the y component would be pointing downward. And then for the other electric field vector, we would have the x component pointing to the right, and then the y component pointing downward. And we can see that the x components are pointing in completely opposite directions, and they will therefore cancel. And what that means is that we only have to consider the y components of the electric fields. And so we can sort of summarize that conclusion in this little box here, just to keep ourselves reminded of that fact that we only need to consider the y components. Now we're also going to take advantage of the following insight here. We can redraw the y components of the red colored electric field and redraw the y component of the blue colored electric field. We can once again see that the magnitude as well as direction of that y component for the red electric field is the same as the y component of the blue electric field. So what we can actually focus on doing is just finding the y components of the red electric field and then whatever we get for that y component of the red electric field, we can just double it because we're going to have an equal contribution from the blue electric field. So really, we're only going to focus on the upper left quadrant of this picture and then get that result and simply double it to get the total electric field. And so we have summarized that strategy in this box right here, just again as a friendly reminder. And so now the question becomes, how do we find the y component of the electric field, not just produced by this tiny amount of charge, but produced by the entire length of the semicircle that we have labeled positive Q? Well, we know that the electric field produced by a point charge is equal to a constant times the charge divided by the distance squared, essentially. When we're dealing with tiny amounts of charge, we can actually say dE is equal to that constant times dq over r squared. And we say dq again because it's just a tiny amount of charge, and dE because it's a tiny electric field. So basically, we have an expression for the electric field that's produced by this tiny amount of charge. Let's not forget that we only want the y component, as noted earlier. So if we redraw the x component and the y component, we can label an angle theta right here. And since the y component is opposite from that angle theta, we would multiply our electric field magnitude by the sine of theta in order to get just that y component. Now, of course, we don't want just the electric field produced by that one differential charge element. We want the electric field produced by the entire length of this positive charge. There are differential charge elements here and here and all along the rod. And so we actually have an infinite number of these differential charge elements, and we want to add up all of their electric fields. Fortunately, calculus allows us to sum an infinite quantity. In essence, all we have to do is take the integral of both sides of this equation, and that's going to allow us to find the entire sum of all of the electric fields produced by those differential charge elements. When we do that, we'll have some initial angle and then some final angle that we'll talk about in just a moment. But first we have to adjust 
our integral because it's in terms of both r and theta, and that becomes problematic. And fortunately, there is a solution to that difficulty. We want to just come off on the side and note that dq, which is again just a tiny amount of charge, is equal to the charge density of this thin glass rod multiplied by the length of that, of that tiny differential element. It's so tiny that length is very small, so we call it ds rather than s. And maybe looking at units would just help make this make a little bit more sense. The unit of charge would be coulombs. Charge density is coulombs per meter. And then the unit of a tiny amount of length would still be meters. The meters would cancel, and we would see that coulombs equals coulombs. So this equation is valid. And therefore, we can substitute lambda, which again is the linear charge density of this thin glass rod, times ds. We can substitute that in for dq into our equation. We're going to make another sort of strategic substitution that has to do with ds. And most of us have learned in a pre-calculus course that the arc length of a circle is equal to a radius multiplied by a central angle theta. Well, we're dealing again with a tiny amount of arc length, so we can kind of modify that equation and call it ds is equal to the radius times a very tiny angle d theta. And so we can actually substitute r d theta for ds, and as we'll see, that's going to allow us to solve the integral more readily. And if we examine this carefully, now we see we have a factor of r in the numerator and denominator, so we can actually cancel out a factor. And then we can move the d theta over to the side here. Now we'll just clean up the workspace and we'll also remove the constants from our integral. It turns out, of course, k is a constant, r is a constant. r is simply the radius of this quarter circle and that's not changing throughout the problem. And then the linear charge density is also a constant because the charge is distributed uniformly along the rod. And so we're gonna take this k lambda over r and just remove it to the outside of the integral. We can also note that the integral of dE is just going to become E, the electric field. Now we'll go ahead and compute the integral of sine theta, which we recall is just negative cos theta. So we can actually perform the integral now. Now, of course, we know k, the radius. We can actually find the linear charge density by noting that the linear charge density would simply be the amount of charge on this thin rod, which is positive Q, divided by the length. Now it's a quarter circle, so we would have to do one fourth times the circumference, which is of course two pi times the radius. A little algebraic simplification would give us two Q over pi times the radius, so we'll substitute that in for lambda. And then actually in the denominator we have pi r times r, so pi r squared. So we're almost ready to plug in. We just got to figure out this final and this initial angle. Maybe to do that, we can go and just look back at the picture. We have a differential charge element that would be right here. That electric field would be pointing straight down because it would be pointing away from that positive charge up there. Then we have another differential element over here, which would be pointing straight to the right, again, away from the positive charge. And then every other differential element in between would be producing electric fields between the two extremes that we just labeled there. And so we can actually integrate over a 90 degree interval, essentially. So basically, as long as we choose our initial angle and our final angle to comprise 90 degrees, we'll be all right. So maybe we can actually call the initial angle zero and the final angle 90 degrees or pi over two. We can then plug in the upper limit and subtract the lower limit. And the inside of the brackets would simplify to 0 minus 1, which is negative 1. So this will actually just become positive out here. And so here is the magnitude of the electric field. Now let's not forget we have to double this result because this was the electric field produced by just the positive thin glass rod. There was also the negative thin glass rod. And we had concluded earlier that we're going to simply double the result that we're obtaining right now to get the overall electric field. So just don't forget to double it. We'll plug in k, q, and the radius. Don't forget, by the way, to change the picocoulombs to coulombs by multiplying it by 10 to the minus 12th. And then when we crunch this down, we should get 
approximately 20.6 newtons per coulomb. This is the correct answer, finally, to part A of the question. And then we've already solved part B as well. It wants the direction. You may have to go back and watch the beginning half of the video, but we had concluded that the Y components were pointing downward. And so the overall direction of this electric field will be downward. They want that angle relative to the positive direction of the X axis. So we can actually say negative 90 degrees. That is another way of saying downward. So that would be the correct answer for the direction of this electric field.